Now let's look at sequel, the latest incarnation, shell interface to Cassandra, or SQL shell. This will provide you if you have RDVMS experience with a familiar environment. So SQL 3 or S or CQL 3, similar to SQL's management interfaces. So features Cassandra's, and this is of course SQL-like query language. And for simplicity, it's SQL-like. And it's a Cassandra client that uses Thrift. So Thrift base, which means it'll connect to TCP 9160 by default to ensure that your firewalls are open for that. And one other note that comes to mind is that the rows that you ultimately work with need not all have the same columns populated as with, say, the Cassandra client, the CLI client. So this is where we see the benefits of semi-structured, unstructured, so basically benefits of semi as well as unstructured and if necessary fully structured data sets come to play with respect to Cassandra so basically whatever attributes are available for your keys within your stores you can make them available without worry about the other missing data for that particular key so let's take a look at using the client SQL SH connection this will give us a new client instance, and by default it connects to the local instance, and of course it's in bin within the distribution of Cassandra, so that's going to be bin SQL or CQL SH. And this connects to default cluster. Let's see what this does for us. So SQL SH, no options, propel us to localhost 9160, the default listener for thrift clients and it's using a particular version of the thrift protocol connected to cassandra and this is the instance of the sql shell not necessarily the sql spec which is version 3x so like the standard command interface help is available and we see what's more commonly recognized or used within the SQL world. So standard SQL statements such as DDL, DML statements. We also see the ability to describe the objects on the system to show various objects. It help with any of these commands such as help show for example. Tab completion works will show you what you may see. So show version, show assumptions. Assumptions are important with respect to how data are interpolated and presented. So Oftentimes you'll find that you set the assumptions to UTF-8 to properly display UTF formatted data, but you can have a run of these. So for example, if you've lost track of the connected host, show web host shows you the cluster to which you're connected, web app cluster, and the TCP socket information. Show assumptions, dumps any assumptions that are defined, currently none are. But if necessary, if you see, for example, hash versions of your data, then you'll change your assumptions to match the appropriate types, which is usually UTF-8, which represents the majority of data that will store. Show version shows the version, as we've already seen, and a number of other items. Now, as far as our key spaces, we know that we have one defined for our web application, our fictitious web application. So if we use the describe, for example, and describe or desk R is a short or an abbreviation of describe, so you can use either. Let's say we'd like to describe the key spaces. If you know the key space, then indicate key space singular followed by the name of a key space, or otherwise just have it dump the various key spaces. So here are the standard ones, system system auth, as well as system traces since we've already clobbered the other key space. So describe key spaces, dumps available key spaces, including system star or system related 
key spaces. And then there's a set of show commands, which can be quite helpful. So show and just tab it out. For example, show host, show version, etc., can be useful. We terminate all our commands as we do at the CLI with semicolon as the official terminator. So how about creating a new attribute or a new key space with column families, attributes, etc. So two, let's go ahead and do that. We want to create a key space, calling it say web app one. Now we're currently connected to a cluster and it's called web app cluster. So beneath the web app cluster we'll have web app one, the key space. So that should be easy to define. So because the commands are similar to SQL, typical structured query language, we can use a create command such as create database, but instead we create a key space followed by the name, let's say web app one. And then we specify the settings that determine how the key space is to be replicated and the strategy that is to be used for replication, such as simple strategy, network topology, etc. So, Tab completion is supported, so we can tab it out and copy it back over. So let's go ahead and create key space. And let's call it web app one. And then you specify any number of options. And you can do so after the with option. Now when you tab, you automatically get replication because that's perhaps the most important feature of a key space, how it's replicated. And if you tab, you'll see number of strategies that are available. If you specify network topology, then you should be prepared to specify data center related information. For now, let's go ahead and specify simple strategy. Tab it out and completes all that for us. Then it moves on to the replication factor. So because we have a single node, it makes sense to specify a replication factor of one. You can specify a replication factor that's greater than the number of hosts, but it doesn't make sense. So perhaps a sensible thing to do, unless of course you plan to introduce another node momentarily. Otherwise you could run the risk of throwing errors. So this is a full statement to create the schema similar to what we've done within the traditional legacy client and tab completion is supported as we've mentioned and that creates it for us. So simple strategy, replication factor one. That begs the question, why not use network topology strategy? Well, with the network topology strategy, we at a minimum must specify data center information, such as data center, rack information, DC one, rack one, for example. And it's no big deal, we can specify it, but let's just start with a simple strategy, which relegates us to one DC. And this will, of course, give us some room to consider how to migrate, let's say, from one DC to multiple DCs as our environment, our Cassandra database environment grows. So let's create a key space for us. And to confirm our key spaces, again, we can do a show. And if we go through the command history, we should see, let's do our describe. In fact, show will show us the system related information. Describe will show us the key spaces. There is our new key space, describe key spaces. Shows web app one. We're currently not within the context of web app one. So we need to use it as we've done with the legacy client. Let's follow this up with a describe and enumerates new key space. And that's there. And we can always add column families and so on with subsequent DML commands or DDL commands, definition commands, and then manipulate the data using a standard SQL-like, SQL-like commands. To drop the key space, just use drop That'll dump it for you, followed by the name of the key space. And that's rather self-explanatory. So drop key space, for example. Web app one, this wipes everything. So ensure that you have a backup. All data are removed. And a recreate, of course, will regenerate it accordingly. So use drop as you would within a standard structured queried language environment. So three, drop key space. And that's merely drop key space, the name of the key space, and it vanishes momentarily. Recreate it with a create key space command to have it repopulated. Now, instead of using column families, the semantics of table, which come over from structured query language are used. So we talk about tables, which are really column families as they represent a number of columns, one or more. So when we create tables, we actually use a create table statement, which is more SQL-like or structured query language-like, but we do so after having first used 
the particular space. So let's go ahead and describe and then use web app one. This places us within the context hierarchically beneath the actual cluster and within the key space. So define column family and in SQL client, CQL that is, this is essentially a table but it recognizes a column family by Cassandra. So we'll use the create table statement. Let's say we go with the same users table. And let's say we describe it this time with different columns. Instead of user one, user two, etc. let's say we use ID with big int, which is 64 bits. That should give us unique entries up to 2 to the 64th. And let's say username is our second column of type text first name text, and this is again more SQL-like, SQL-like, L name text, and a primary key. Now, it's important that you define a primary key because after all, although we're using structured query language like syntax, under the hood, Cassandra is a key value store, and everything's tied to a particular key, so it is imperative that each column family has at least one defined or a primary key defined and optional indexes defined on top of that to improve performance and perform or permit or facilitate criteria searching and so on. Let's just note this that it is imperative to define at least one primary key. You can define a primary key that's a composite for example that includes multiple columns such as let's say users maybe user or let's say username and F name or username and ID or otherwise but at a minimum have one particular column designated as the unique identifier by which we'll be able to reference or have Cassandra hash the values and quickly reference those values regardless of where they live in the, the cluster so let's go ahead and paste this in and this will create that for us now to see what's there, if we do a describe, for example, table users, this will give us a structure. So primary key is set on username, text, text, ID, so on and so forth. Compaction, replication is on, etc. What other options may be available for us, for example? Well, you can see whether or not indexes have been defined. We've yet to define any. You can describe other objects. If you do a help, for example, describe, you'll see that you can describe, let's say, the various tables that are available or collection column families within this collection. So describe tables plural shows the list of tables that are part of this particular key space. So that's a table. Now how do we place data? Well again, it's standard structured query language. So we'd simply need to use an insert statement which effectively is your set. So insert data and in traditional Cassandra speak this is basically a set. Now let's just note that insert in CQL translates or doubles as update as well. So if a value already exists and you perform an insert that particular row is updated and if not it's created anew within the column family structure or the table structure, the tabular structure. So to populate values now we still have the flexibility of populating the columns that are of interest to us. So although we've defined as again it's important that we point this out because you can set all sorts of restrictions and relational databases and if you fail to provide those data then your inserts or DMLs will fail. So if we fail to, let's take a look at that schema again. Let's go back, describe table users. Let's say for a particular record, we supply username and F name, but no L name or ID or otherwise, then that's not a problem. So let's go ahead and insert into standard SQL into the user's key space. Let's say for username, F name, L name, some values. And those values will, let's say, be Linux CBT at Linux CBT Ubu Serve 1, Linux CBT dot internal. And perhaps the F name will be as follows. 
And let's call this L name is perhaps user one, for example. This will insert accordingly. Nothing special here if you're familiar with structured query language. Let's go ahead and paste this in. And then that gives us new data. So how do we confirm that the data exists? Well, you can use this client or the standard client, just have to shift the syntax accordingly. But a select will do the trick. So select, let's say from users, gives us the data defined. We omitted ID, so it's null, no problems there whatsoever. So the ID isn't being treated here as some sort of auto counter or auto incrementing column, although facilities are there to do that as well if you'd like to keep track of the users in that fashion. You can even count the records that are there, no big deal there either, so there's a count function to quickly ascertain how many records exist in the database. So this is becoming more and more, this interface that is like a standard MySQL monitor, a terminal monitor, insofar as being able to manage and define the structures that house our data. And of course, you can select the individual columns, no problems there whatsoever. So if it's more apropos, let's say, to pull first name first, followed by username, then you can do it as well. Now, how about aliases? Let's say you wanted username as user, let's say uppercase. It doesn't take it in that particular case. So that's a function that's not translated directly one-to-one -one from standard SQL. So... Now, there may be other hooks or workarounds for it, but nonetheless, it, it doesn't translate directly over. So if you have queries written in SQL that have the as specified the way we've indicated it, so select a particular column as a particular name. Even if you change a name, let's say user4, for example, it doesn't auto-format the column header. What about case sensitivity, let's say, on the columns that are defined? So let's say we want username upper. No problems, it's case insensitive in that case. What if we mix the case? In this case, it doesn't match it, but that's because of the user four. Let's fix that, let's drop this to lower. No problems, the column headers, the descriptors are all case insensitive, so that's not an issue there. So note, not all SQL commands, in fact, many won't, will transfer, and also column headers are case insensitive in the event that this is an issue with respect to code that you might have out there that's in mixed case, let's say coming over from a Windows environment where case is entirely ignored. And to drop records, you just do this delete, for example. Let's go ahead and insert something else from our history, maybe altering something. So maybe we alter this to include maybe an ID field, and this will become, let's say, at 2 with the user of the following, maybe two for here, and then ID to follow is maybe one. And then let's select star, so we get those items. Let's select everything. When we select the distinct items, and of course a count will give us just two items, no surprises there whatsoever. So it's rather straightforward, just to familiarize. So this user has an ID, this doesn't. Now what about updates? Well, if you insert into the user, it updates as well. So let's say we performed an insert on the same user. And insofar as duplicates are concerned, you'll see that it doesn't actually. So in certain to users, let's say instead of serve two, serve one this time and a value of maybe two for that record, or even zero. It's, it should be signed, so it shouldn't be an issue. Now, as long as we specify the column, the appropriate order, so ID, then it should work. So let's have a look, select star, and there we see zero is the index. It is an auto-indexing, but you can place it. And for sign values, well, let's see. Let's say we had a negative two, for example. And we select star, well, it's now negative two. So it's signed, 64-bit, no problems whatsoever. That works. And of course, the delete users just delete. As we've mentioned, the ability to remove columnar data is also critical because that allows far more flexibility than standard structured query language. So delete data, of course, using delete manipulation language statements. So for example, delete from users, which is our key space, or column family that is within the key space web app one. So we'll delete from users where let's say, and this is criteria based. Now this is where I, why indexing is usually important because it makes these queries much, much quicker. So let's say we start by first deleting a column. Delete from deletes everything. 
but delete let's say let's pick a value maybe we'll delete the ID for example from one of them so delete ID from users where now without a query this would remove all the IDs so for example removes column their value ID for all defined rows in this particular column family let's try this out and again it's flexibility it won't clobber the other records that are there let's just take a look it's expecting criteria so let's go ahead and give it where username or let's say l name since it's shorter is equal to user2 notice it threw an error let's go ahead and do a describe table users again now notice the original index was set on the primary key username so for criteria and this applies to SQL as well though there's some implicit assumptions made by standard structured query language to allow the criteria to be built such that we don't have to outright specify it but it happens internally with structured query language so let's say we change the criteria from L name, which is not index, to username, which is, and then take the value, let's say for this user, whom we intend to update and paste that in and see how it behaves. Notice it works there. So what this tells us is that unless the column that's associated with, at least this is for up until this version at least, has an index, then the criteria building commands will fail. So now we see that the item's been wiped for that particular user. So Let's just include that as well. This is a little workaround to how you'll work your queries, but you can always index on more columns to alleviate this problem. So let's just note where criteria in queries, even and including delete queries, depend on predefined indices. Now, of course, you can always update the indexes associated with the table or column family to reflect, let's say, other columns on which you might perform criteria. Of course, any sort of criteria requires indexing, which requires more space, more memory, etc., more resources, etc. So the whole idea is that these data are distributed in a fast fashion. So the less we deal with the semantics of structured query language and relational databases, the better. And that's why it can be an issue. Now, what about the variation of insert, which is update, which is more familiar for making changes? So update data which is basically an insert or a set. So it's really a set which performs both roles. So update using criteria again, but then be careful that you have an index on the appropriate column. So let's say we try to update users and set maybe ID equal to for this first, or the instance we remove, let's say to negative one, just to be logical or to be sequential. So we set this equal to negative one. And of course we need criteria to indicate who should be updated. So what if we tried where L name is equal to user two as we did before. Let's just make sure that that's properly spelled. Again, the contingency issue becomes a headache. So let's take this in and try to update a simple column set ID equal to something and has a problem with it. Now let's change this to be where username let's say is equal to the full address of the user at UbuServe2. Copy and paste that, paste that in. And now the criteria or criterion is fulfilled and no problems whatsoever. So be sure. So even for update, wherever criteria need to be defined using where, for example, you must have a predefined indice index in place. So this becomes, of course, username equal to. And let's just put that into place. Username is equal to whatever the full address happens to be. So let's copy and paste this in. It just drives on the point that the indices are important to drive these queries. So where username is equal to that. So delete ID from users where username is equal to some username value. And of course you can do full-fledged deletes just as you can with standard SQL. So if you're not using a where and you just want to delete outright, well, then you end up removing all records. So it's always important that you delete using criteria. So delete from users, let's say where username is equal to the second one, or at ubu serve two, and this removes 
entire row instead of selective columns from the column family. But it still depends on the criteria. So let's get rid of that. Let's have a quick look. Select star, the user is gone again. No problems. And in our history, we should have. Now, what if we did an update to insert the value? It would work because, again, it's just an alias to set. So let's place this in. This should be four. Let's make this negative one and the server two. Just to have a slight differentiator. Select star. So there are your two values once again. So these standard commands that you're accustomed to, we're all accustomed to from the world of structured query language, work within SQL. Now, before we move on to actually clustering, let's just confirm data with traditional legacy client, the thrift client. And that's, of course, the Cassandra CLI. Just to be sure that what we're doing isn't specific to SQL 3 or to the SQL SH, if we do a show version, for example, 2.30 of the interface, the terminal monitor. So to quit, quit, and you not save anything explicitly. And then from this directory, Cassandra CLI, this will give us a thrift connection using the old fashioned client. So help. So how do we see what's there? Well, we can take a look at the various key spaces. We can show key spaces. This will show the standard key spaces plus the most recently defined web app one. We use web app one. And then of course we know that it has various tables associated with it. Column families, of course. Before doing so, let's go ahead and do a describe or column family or just outright describe. So this shows us the strategy simple. Replication factor one, and a help describe reveals the options that are available. So key space, if you have the name, which we know is users, of course, so describe, or the users, web app one, but the column family, that is, and we always interchange them, is users. So this shows us how users is laid out. And notice it doesn't give us a big dump of columns the way the SQL interface does. It largely tells us the data type, UTF-8, default column validator, bytes type, that might need to be manipulated. Otherwise, we'll have to change the assumption type in the SQL interface so that the hash value isn't shown. Now, what about examining the content using the old interface. So if you did a list users, we know that's a table that's defined. Here are the values. And what we meant earlier when we mentioned that the values are thrown in a hash, we'll notice F name, hash, ID, hash, although they're simple values, etc. So that's because by default, the results are stored in their byte formation representation. But in order to have it translated, we need to ensure that we do an assumption and set it to UTF, for example, UTF-8. So if you do a help assume, for example, here are the types that can be specified. If you scroll towards the top, because this dumps a lot of information rather quickly, let's just see where we are here. So you assume, let's say, a column family for individual items, let's say the comparator, the validator, so on and so forth, is a particular type, that the keys are a certain type. So you assume, let's say, users, keys, or users, validator, is set to a separate particular type. So assume in the column family users and for validation, again, not to be thrown off. So we're interested in the validator and that's going to be UTF eight. Now let's go ahead and do a list users again. And of course we get an error on one of the columns, but for another it translates nicely because it truly can be represented by UTF-8. What if we represented it by bytes, for example? And then try to list users. What you get are the actual bytes to which it's stored. But the SQL client always reflects the output using the original type that was stored. So when you define your table structures, you can either set everything to be UTF-8, which covers a lot of data types, or carefully define the individual column types and match it to your data. And then you have to set your assumptions accordingly. Again, a help on assume gives a sense for the different types of data that may be 
covered. For example, we know that big int or integer is associated with the ID column. And of course, this can lead to some confusion, which is why the preferred method is to use the SQL SH. Actually, this wrote the assumptions to assumptions JSON. And then let's go ahead and use our web app and select star from users, and it displays nicely. So there are some translation issues across the clients. Now going forward, Cassandra's using SQL Shell, which is like MySQL's terminal monitor. This is a client you want to use, but because you'll invariably come across older implementations for which it's not so easy to just quickly migrate to 1, 2x and higher, we should have some sense as to how both clients will work so we can how both clients work so we can interact between them but they are representing the information in different ways and as you define your table structures which are basically your column families it's imperative that you indicate the types of data that will be stored accordingly regardless of whether you use SQL shell or the CLI client so for now we have some basic data and nothing to write home about just yet. Just a little familiarity again. All we have is an instance running in the foreground, throws us data, and a separate shell so that we can run the commands. No formal setup, but already we're making some progress with Cassandra. So next, let's take a look at incorporating some other nodes into the system and see what happens when replication becomes the order of the day.